Working towards a goal tends to keep one motivated when embarking on a journey. To achieve your desired goal, you need to think about the steps required to get there. The process of thinking about and documenting these steps is known as planning. Having a solid plan in place keeps you organized and focused. Humans have 60 to 80,000 thoughts a day on average. Organizing your data doesn't need to be one of them as Excel makes this job a breeze. Excel skills stand you in good stead in the workplace, but have you ever thought about how it can boost your career? Excel is not only for the finance departments in an organization, over 27 million vacancies across multiple sites will show the increase in the need for employees with killer spreadsheet abilities. According to a study by Capital One and Burning Glass Technologies, the probability of a promotion or increase in the figures in your bank account increases by 12% on average if you're a certified Excel user. In lesson one, we spoke about your tree of Excel knowledge. Well, I guess we've just proven that money really does grow on trees. By the end of this lesson, you will have added a few more functions to your tree with a focus on dates. You will understand the difference between absolute and relative referencing and when to use them. And last but not least, we're going to get organized and use basic sorting and filtering techniques. I hope you're ready for an action-packed, fun-filled lesson four, where we get organized. First up, we'll be venturing into a new tab and working with the formula bar. The formula bar can be found below the ribbon. In the View tab, you can hide it or show it depending on your mood. Next to the formula bar is a button with the letters FX. The FX command opens the Insert Function dialog box, which is a directory where you can search for functions, for example the sum if that we covered in Lesson 3, and acts as a wizard for entering functions. There are three ways to enter data using the formula bar. As a recap of lesson one, you can enter the data directly into the active cell. A copy of this is reflected in the formula bar. Or you can enter directly in the formula bar and a copy is reflected in the active cell. But I'm sure you are an expert by now due to all the practice. But here's another option for you. The third way is to use the FX command button that launches the function arguments dialog box, but let's look at that in more detail in the demonstration. Dates are very fussy to work with and need to be in a specific format in order to work. Once in the correct format, they become very powerful and you can use them in more complex formulas. To add a simple date function, you can simply use the equals date. The arguments required will be the year, month, and day. With this, you can enter any date you'd like. You can then change the format of the date using the number group in the Home tab that we covered in Lesson 2. If you will be working in the same spreadsheet daily, where you may want the date to automatically update every day, using the Today formula does just that. If you're keeping track of the time as well, the now function adds in the time and the date, and depending on the format you've selected, you can watch the seconds update with every change you make to the spreadsheet. Dates are great for date stamping your work, but just ensure you select the correct type, being a static function where the date doesn't change, or a live function which updates over time. The live functions are really useful in more complex formulas to create things such as countdown timers. Now isn't that something to look forward to? And of course, what would Excel be without a shortcut? To enter the current static date, you can use control and semicolon. And to enter the time, you can use control shift and colon. So welcome back to Excel. And hopefully this is starting to feel like home. 
you already know that we have the formula bar at the top and to the left you can see the fx command to insert a function. Let's explore another room in our home. And within the view tab, this is where you can hide or show the formula bar. By clicking the fx command, we can practice searching for a function. So let's do an example to search for a function to add numbers together. In this list, do you recognize the sum function? We'll select this one and hit OK. In the function arguments dialog box, it now asks us to enter the arguments for the sum function, being the numbers that we want to add together. So we can click on number 1, and to go to the next argument, you can click in the bar and select the next number. Alternatively, you can press tab to move to the next argument, being number 3. The wonderful thing about the sum function is you can also select a range. So we'll highlight the range, and for number 5, we'll highlight the next range. Let's look at what else we find in this dialog box. You can enter up to 255 arguments for the sum function. In the function arguments dialog box, you can see your inputs and your outputs to check your formula for accuracy before even pressing enter. So for argument number 1, we've selected cell C3 being number 1. And that is exactly what we've intended to do. You can also see the potential output, which will be the sum of all the numbers we've selected, which is 28. The dialog box also gives you a brief explanation of the purpose of the function, which is to add all the numbers in a range of cells. For each argument, it provides you with guidance as to what data type you can enter. At the bottom, you can also see the formula result. And if you're still stuck, there is a link to the help function, which takes you to the Microsoft support website. So rest assured, you will be supported every step of the way. When you're happy, click OK. And we get our result, as expected. You can also check it using the status bar, and you'll see we've got the correct answer. The last benefit I want to highlight is the ability to see the cells linked to your function. Double click in the cell with the function and Excel supports the tracing of this function using color coded blocks. And again, I can double check that I've included the correct cells as arguments in my function. Press enter to accept it as correct. Do you have any questions? Let's not forget our assistant Morpheus, the AI bot who is here to support you. For us to interact, when I ask you a question, drop your answers into the chat box that appears on your screen. Here you can interact with your fellow classmates and don't forget to rate the feedback and answers, which will only enhance your experience with Morpheus. If you're still unsure and have any questions, you can send us an email to support at shawacademy.com and I will respond as soon as possible. With all that talk on dates, let me pose a question to you now. What is the first valid date that Excel recognizes? Where does Excel's calendar start? You would think it would start from the date Excel was invented, but this is not to be. The first date recognized by Excel is actually the 1st of January 1900. But why? It uses this as a starting point and counts the number of days that has elapsed since then to work out dates in the date functions we've discussed. Excel was also developed after Lotus 123, another spreadsheet program, so adopted the same serial date system for compatibility reasons. Enough said. Next up, referencing. I'm not talking about the Harvard or APA method. 
We touched on cell references and using them in linking worksheets and workbooks in Lesson 3. Let's take that a step further and talk about absolute and relative referencing. A picture says a thousand words, and like this picture, you can think of an absolute reference as a brick wall. It does not move, whereas your relative references change, like the leaves will blow relative to the direction of the wind. When we speak about absolute referencing, we refer to it as the act of locking cells. We can lock cells by using the dollar symbol. And going one step further, you can lock just the row or just the column reference. And this is known as mixed referencing. Don't worry if this all sounds like Greek. Let's unpack these concepts in Excel. Let's recap the concept of linking a cell. If you want to link two cells in a worksheet, use the equal sign and select the cell you want to link. If you inspect the formula, we can see the data in the formula bar, which is the cell address of the source cell. This is where our information is being pulled from. The cell address is made up of two parts, being a column and a row number. At the moment, the cell is not locked. So if I use my autofill cursor and drag this down, let's see what happens. We get a list of zeros. Why could that be? If we step into the next row, you can see the row reference has updated to 5. For each row, as I move down, you can see the row reference is changing by 1 as I move down one cell. Let's try the same experiment by moving right. Using the autofill cursor, drag your formula. Do you notice the difference? The column reference is now changing by 1 as we move one cell to the right. For absolute referencing, you follow the same principle to link a cell as before. Enter equals, and now we'll use the F4 key once to add in the dollars. No matter which direction I now drag the formula, it will always refer back to the cell address L2 as we've locked that reference in place. If you look at the absolute reference, you will notice the dollar sign appears before the column as well as before the row. Moving on to our row references, if we follow the same principle to link to our cell, and now we'll hit the F4 key twice, we've locked only the row reference in place. If we drag the formula, row 9 is locked, but the column reference will change. Going the other way, if we lock the column reference in place by hitting the F4 key three times, the column will stay the same and the row reference updates. Now let's apply those principles to an example. Does this table look familiar? It's the one we created at the end of lesson two. I want to remove the structured references, so I will need to remove the table feature. And a little tip is in order to identify whether you've created a table, if you click anywhere within the data, the table design contextual tab becomes available. In this tab, I can then convert my data to a normal range by clicking this option in the tools group. I will select yes and the benefits of the table has disappeared. So coming back to our normal data range, we can now experiment with the relative mixed and absolute referencing. I'm going to delete the totals and re-enter this formula. I'm multiplying the quantity in cell D3 by the cost in cell E3. If we were still using the table feature, 
Do you remember that Excel would have copied this formula down for us to the rest of the rows? But for now, if we want to apply this formula to the next row, we will have to click, hold and drag. And here you can see the concept of relative referencing in action. As I've copied the formula down one row, the row references have updated to D4 multiplied by E4. I can safely copy this to the remaining rows. But now I want to test the theory of mixed referencing. In these three formulas, the rows D and E have not changed. They have, for all intents and purposes, been locked. Therefore, if we add, using the F4 key, a lock to the columns and copy this formula now, the values will not change. So therefore, in this scenario, you can use relative referencing or mixed referencing. And another tip to quickly copy your formulas is when you see the autofill cursor to double click. This can only be done if there is a range of data directly next to the formulas you want to copy. Now let's imagine there is a, another store that is having a sale on all of their items and their item prices are fixed at $5, no matter what you buy. So I'm going to call this Shop 2. In order to recalculate the total cost now, instead of manually entering the formula into each cell with the new price, we can use absolute referencing. Before we do that, let's have a look at what happens if we drag this formula down. We'll get a zero. By inspecting this formula, you can see that while we started in H1, as I drag the formula down, the row reference has updated to H2. This is the case for the next formula. Because we want to keep the $5 in H1, we can use F4 to insert an absolute reference and now we can proceed to copy the formula down. Now let's use the sum if formula to identify the total cost of each category at shop 1 and at shop 2. So I will add the categories here. Let's practice using the function arguments dialog box. So in our range, we will highlight the category. The criteria we will search for is house product and the sum range will be the total for shop one. Hit enter. It is very important to note that when you enter the criteria in another cell, that it is spelt in exactly the same way as it appears in your category or your range column. Let's repeat this process to calculate the total groceries for shop one. And we'll do the same for shop two. If we inspect the sum if formula for shop one totals, for shop 2, the only argument that will change is the total. So we can fix column B as our range will stay the same as well as our criteria. If you drag this formula to shop 2, you'll see the amount has updated. And if you step into the cell, you can see the correct total column has now been highlighted. Let's do the same for groceries. And with a little bit of formatting, we can instantly see that it would be far cheaper to purchase our house products at shop 2 and our groceries at shop 1. And as we mentioned at the end of lesson 3, the average is another handy function to use. So let's have a look at the average number of units as well as 
the average cost of our items. So using the average function, we can highlight the quantity column. And let's do the same for the cost. And again with some formatting, don't forget to remove the decimals. Now you can see on average we are purchasing six of each item and the average cost of each item is about $4.49. I think that's good going. While these are just the basic principles, it can be a bit overwhelming. Let's check your understanding of referencing with a quick question. True or false? Is this an absolute reference? The best advice I can give you is to practice locking cells and experiment with mixed references. Speaking of, the statement is false as column B is not locked, making this a mixed reference. From mixed references to a mixture of skills, let's pause to appreciate your learning achieved to date. You're doing really well on the analysis front thanks to the date functions. From an integrity perspective, the insert functions command and basic inspecting of data are tools we can use to check the accuracy of our data at all times. Now let's see how else we will be adding to our data analysis skill set by taking a look at what's coming up next. Still to come, we will look at some tools for organizing and analyzing your data to help answer those burning questions by using sorting and filtering. And as I like to say, if you don't use it, you lose it. So we must put our skills to the test in a demonstration. Like sorting jelly beans into the different colors, you can sort your data. Instead of sorting things in Excel, you can sort your text in ascending or descending order, numbers from lowest to highest, or vice versa, dates in chronological order, and if you wanted to log your jelly bean collection, you can even sort your data by color. I'm sure it will come as no surprise that you can even customize your sorting options, but stay tuned for this in lesson 8. Filtering is very similar to sorting, and you can add a filter to one column or even a whole table. The types of filters and being able to customize your filter are also very similar to sorting. However, the main difference is that sorting organizes your data in a specific way, whereas filtering will only show the relevant data based on the criteria you've specified. Here we have the sales data from lesson 3. Do you remember the shortcut to convert the range to a table? Control T adds a table as well as the filter drop downs to our column headings. Let's start by sorting the sales rep in alphabetical order. So select the column heading and in the editing group, under sort and filter, Select Sort A to Z. You can also select Descending Order if that's your preference. Let's sort this table to show us all the sales reps that worked in each month. The little arrow in the filter drop-down indicates that a sorting has been applied to the salesperson column. You can also use the filter drop-down box to quickly access these options if you prefer. Now let's sort our total sales from highest to lowest using the filter drop-down. Here you can see the binders seem to be the top seller. You will have noticed that when we sorted the data by sales rep and total sales, we could view the whole data set the entire time. But what happens when we add a filter? Let's look at the sales for the month of January. In the drop-down box, deselect all and just select January and click OK. It only shows us the records relating to January. Here we can see three sales reps sold the binders and the pencils in the month of January. Now if you want to look at December, you can add it. 
or we can look at December on its own. And here again, three sales reps managed to sell the popular binders and some desks. Another trick linked to the filter is you can search. If you do not see the option you need, or you have a really long list, you can type in November and select OK. If your list is not extensively long, hovering over the bottom right corner will allow you to resize the filter dialog box to show all the options available. And in Excel, what you can add, you can remove. So to remove the filter, you can navigate the ribbon and in the editing group, you can clear the filter to show all the data again or remove the filter completely by toggling it off. Whether you're in a table or a normal range of data, you can use a keyboard shortcut to add and remove your filters. But I'm not going to tell you just yet what that is. Are you able to hazard a guess at which shortcut adds and removes a filter? Is it Control F, Control L, or Control Shift L? The correct answer is C. What is really interesting is that Control and L actually also creates a table. And as you know, so does Control T. I hope that bit of trivia got you fired up. But now coming back to our shopping list, let's put that shortcut into practice. So we'll hold Control, Shift and L to remove the filter. And we can bring that back by holding Control, Shift and L again. Some pointers on sorting and filtering effectively is you've included a heading for each column and that this heading can be easily distinguished from the rest of your data. The importance of the heading is especially prominent when sorting, as when sorting text alphabetically, Excel may include the heading in your list. Now when filtering, and we perhaps only want to show the groceries, don't panic, Excel has not deleted your data. Remember we spoke about the difference between sorting and filtering. So by showing only the relevant records we specified, Excel has hidden the rest of the data between rows 2 and 30. Lastly, filtering and sorting can be applied to any table or normal range of data of any size. However, you must ensure that your data does not contain any blank rows. If we had a blank row, Excel will only be able to read the data up until the blank row. So you can see the only items available for filtering is house products. If you delete the blank row, Excel then updates the filter for us. And one last tip, if you're going to be working in large tables, don't forget your navigation shortcuts from Lesson 1. Like with navigating a worksheet, you can navigate within a table also using the arrow keys. Holding Control and right arrow takes you to the last column in your data set. Holding Control down takes you to the bottom of your data. Control left takes you to the first column of your data and control up takes you back. The control key enables you to navigate the perimeter of your data set. However, to move within your data, just using the arrow keys will get you to where you need to be.